the Lord teaches us that when something bothers us by way of our conscience, to go to him, to settle it, never to keep it. He does not want us to keep it. Because if you are disturbed by way of your conscience, then you're also in danger. You may not know it. So we go to him to clear our conscience. In other words, to change some things in our lives. He'll point that out. We make adjustments. We repent, which means to turn away from and never do again. And we continue seeking the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. Scripture is truth. If someone doubts the scripture, it's because they believe in something else. If the scriptures are truth, then that person is believing in a lie. And normally, they believe in a way that they have been comfortable with, or a way that another person showed them that they hold in admiration. In either case, when you already have one truth, you will reject the others. So it's important that we accept the truth from who? Christ Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If we trust him, we may have his truth. One of the hopes here is that every one of us should know how to possess our vessels in sanctification and honor. 1 Thessalonians 4.4 4. That every one of us should know how to possess our vessels in sanctification and honor, not in lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, because they had these open societies back then, no instruction from the Lord. So naturally, they didn't really function as we do. So that not the lust of concupiscence, that would be a longing that when your mind can't turn that lust off, it can't turn that desire off. Part of that is how society is formed. The music you listen to, the movies you watch, all of it is about an open society with Aquarius overtones. It really is. They throw this stuff in there. Why? Because they, within themselves, have not chosen the path of Christ. They have chosen their own path. And if your life is not geared towards Christ, then your life will yield a darkness. If a person is not facing Christ, right, and his principles and his ways, it's going to yield darkness. And that darkness spreads in many different ways. The people who make these movies, they are not aware of everything they do. They have ideas. They have dreams. They sit there and do remote writing, spiritual writing. And these, a lot of these movies are given to them by way of dreams. And some sort of writing that they do, channeling some other spirits to write, is given to them that way. A lot of these actors, they have to become possessed to play their role all the way through. So it says, we should know how to possess our vessels, which our body, in sanctification and in honor. The honor part is physical. Sanctification is for our Father. That is spiritual. Not in the lust of concupiscence or longing, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, because again, their societies are based on fulfilling lusts. Gentiles magnify lusts, and they brag about lust, kind of like our world today. Because everything we do in this world, lust is at the base of it in these earthly, worldly kingdoms. In all kingdoms are worldly. There's only one kingdom, that is heavenly. That's our Father's kingdom. Not the kingdom people can touch with their hands, but the one established by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is why it was not mentioned that way in the Old Testament. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. He didn't call any of us into uncleanness. That's why I don't excuse the flesh on my own behalf, nor anybody else's. I won't do it, because I know that's not what the Lord called us into, to compromise by way of flesh. And a person, based upon how sincere you receive the calling, based upon how sincere you receive it, that's going to really mark your level of your calling that you begin to enter into, because a lot of people are not serious about the calling. One of the first things they'll say is, well, God understands giving themselves excuses, which is why their growth is hindered. Growth is hindered when we continue to say that. Well, God understands that, you know, we can't get it together. I know a person right now is 85 years old. They're saying the same exact thing. Well, God understands. Well, of course he does. But at what point are you going to understand? Because those who love Christ, there is no way a person can fully accept what the Lord did at the cross and then haphazardly walk in this world and serve him that way. There's just no way. That's almost like if you were to marry the love of your life, yet you never desire to see them. Are you kidding? If you married the love of your life, you'd be checking on them every 20 seconds. Hmm, I wonder where they are. Why didn't they call me? 
you start developing paranoia, insecurities, and everything, and then when they call you, your whole world would light up. You'd, oh, everything is fine. Don't mind me. Because you're, you were panicked that something would happen. In other words, they're always going to be on your mind. And when a person accepts what the Lord did at the cross because they truly understand it, there is no way they're going to sit there and say, well, God understands. Those voices that speak such things, uh, most of them are not aware of what they're saying. But those are not seeds of righteousness, but seeds of darkness. It's just that people are not aware of what they're saying, because that teaches other people how not to sincerely approach Christ as a king. That teaches them to discard at any time what he did so they can do their thing, not to have him on their mind. Learn to live an humble life. Learn to set people free, not keep them in bondage. Learn to serve other men, not to hire more servants. Learn to give back, not to take all the time. Because when you do this, it changes how you see life. In this day and age, the way things are set up, none of this is practice, it seems. People don't study to be quiet. They get information so they can be heard. They don't do their own business, but they try to manipulate other people to work for them. They get most of the money and give small wages to the person who did all the labor. They don't work with their own hands, but they seek out those who are talented, skillful at what they do, and they manipulate them to make products for themselves so they can profit from the perfected skill sets of others or the good skill sets of others. They're not practicing what's in here. It's not how society is built. Keep that in mind. First Thessalonians 4.11 is not how society is built. 4.13 But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Those who are asleep are those you can't see, those who are dead. Those who the world would say are dead. Those who you can't see. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Did you hear what he said? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him when he comes. And if they come with him, they will never in the dirt. Hallelujah. Something else was happening. Oh, see, there's a mystery. Somebody else said, wait a minute, the dead in Christ will rise first. They, they come out of the ground all over the place, right? Yeah, but we're reading something else, a promise. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Everybody did not sleep in Jesus. See, you were born in a time after the Messiah came. You were born in a time where you could actually read about the Messiah. You weren't in the times when there was no reading about the Messiah in the privacy of your own home. You weren't born in the time where you could not get a hold of books where education was banned. You weren't born in those times. You were born in a time of freedom. I believe that you were born in this time that you may get the information, the Word of God. You were born so that the Word of God can never be withholden from you. And if you were to go to sleep, you will go to sleep in Christ. You will sleep in Jesus because you're a believer in Christ. And the promise here is the promise for them. That's why that thief died on the cross. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. He didn't go into the ground and go to sleep. And that was it. No. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But you have to be in him. See, the same disciples said, don't deceive yourselves. Don't do it. Don't deceive yourself. And think, oh, I'm going to be one of those with Jesus. But in truth, we're not doing anything to be qualified by the words of Jesus. When you want to know what qualifies you to be counted among who he says will be his. Because we cannot name if we belong to Jesus. Jesus will name who belongs to him. That's why every day is a gift. Every day you have breath is a gift to refine my life and to get it right better than I did yesterday. I will not relax. If any one of you were to die in your state right now, is anything left undone? Because if it is, you get a problem, and you know you have a problem. See, we're not reminded of that often, are we? And we get comfortable because no one talks about, oh, you got a problem. You can't say I've got something to get to, something to turn over in my life, something to get rid of. But you've not done it. Because if you have that put on your heart, who do you think put it on your heart? That's a clear communication. That's why when you open your eyes, you've been given another opportunity to serve the Lord much better than you did the day prior. You're not living in yesterday, but take full advantage of today and honor the Lord in it. But most importantly, since you love the Lord, then don't hold back. Grow and become what you've been sent here to become. Seek Him for guidance, clarity. Give no excuse to the flesh. Because there's nothing in holiness that's going to cause anger. There's nothing in holiness.
going to cause a person to act like hell on earth. That's just not going to happen. In righteousness, there is sobriety. There is a knowing. There's no blindness. There's no deafness. There's no lameness. But all things are restored. There is no insanity. And there's no confusion. Satan is the author of confusion. And all of us see to yield confusion. God does not yield confusion or, or give way to confusion. God's word, the result of God's true word, is rest and peace and an everlasting joy. Why? Because it's holy and true and very convicting but very uplifting. Establishing a hope at every turn. When anybody passes from this world, they're going to one of two places. They're going to torment. They're going to paradise. It's that simple. But the state of those individuals who have died to us, what is their state to us? They are what? They're dead. But Christians don't die. That's why the word sleep was used. That's why he's saying sleep. You see it. See, this, when it says the dead will rise first, now, that should give everybody a key. Dead and sleep are interchangeable in this case. Some are sleeping in Christ. That's what he's saying here. He's telling us what the whole thing is. Some are sleeping in Christ and some are sleeping somewhere else. But in those locations, these people are active, suffering or not suffering. Look at the process. That's why he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so them also which sleep in Jesus. See the designation, sleeping in Jesus. When Jesus came, he descended into Sheol. All who passed prior to the coming of Christ had their opportunity also. We don't need to know all the details about that, but they had their opportunity also. And they are either in Christ or not. Since Christ came, he has the key. Follow me, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. Those that are in paradise with him, he's going to bring with him back to earth. Do you guys hear that? And then, if we are alive when Jesus comes, then we're going to be taken to a higher state. That's what that means. See, to be taken up, just like Jesus ascended. When he ascended, where did he go? He said, I go unto the Father. When we ascend, where are we going? We're going with Christ. We're still ascending from this state of existence into an eternal state of existence. You know what that's called? That's called rising. It's like a promotion. It's a different level. Don't think about just everybody flying up in the air. Don't think about that. Think about the truth of what that is. Rising is to go above, is to be promoted, is to become something higher. Just like in the scriptures, Satan would have you burden yourself with what ifs and thinking about things far outside of our control. The Lord has and will continue to perform things in our lives. Often we don't understand it and often it is painful. But it's important for us to go through everything he does. He's doing it not out of hatred, not to condemn us. But every time we're exposed to something, it's saving our souls. It's not ruining us. It's taking us through a process, and that process is something we would not voluntarily go through. So if you go through something, and if you're a believer in Christ, trust his process, his methods, no matter what it looks like. He understands your tears. He understands your heart. He understands the confusion and the fear. So if we could just understand that whatever he's doing in our lives, it's not for the purposes of condemning us. No, no. If he were going to condemn us, he would have come a long time ago. But that's not what he's done. He is long-suffering, and that means he has great patience, putting up with everything humanity could ever do. Because his will is to have us redeemed. Think about that. Trust his process, his process, our acts of love. Just as sure as a child being punished for doing something terrible in the world that would later on kill him. And you punish that child, taking away every toy he ever had. The child does not see that as an act of love. But you may sit, having taken away the toys, and you may cry because you know how the child feels. But you also know he's going to survive it. He'll soon understand it, and all of his tears will pass. What you do, you do, Jen, not to destroy the child but to cause that child to reflect upon things he would not ordinarily reflect upon. Those are great acts of love and mercy from a very patient creator who has nothing but love for us. He does not look upon us with hatred. He does not look upon us as though we are vile. It's written in the Bible that God's love can be seen in the act what he did. He commanded his love towards us. So he refuses to feel any other way about us than to love us. He commanded his love towards us in that he sent his only begotten son. He sent his word, the same word that made us guilty. Think about that. That same righteous word, perfect word that made us guilty. He nailed it to the cross and he gave us a new word by which we could be redeemed. And we're in that process now. Those who end up servants, 
of those dark lusts will be children of the darkness. Now, keep in mind, the darkness does not know anything other than darkness, but we do, because you've tasted of gentleness. You've tasted of love. You've tasted of compassion. You saw the tears. You know what hurt is. You know what those things are. And because you were exposed to it, if one were to reject Jesus and his way and his principles and his gospel, they would know even more torment based upon what they knew and how they rejected it. See, demons, they don't know what love is like you do. They don't know love. The same way you yearn to show compassion to somebody else, they yearn to kill somebody else slowly, probably. You laugh based on joy. They laugh based on destruction. You're not satisfied until you apologize to somebody. Until somebody holds you back up in a good regard, you're not satisfied for somebody to think of you as being less than what you really are by way of love. You're not satisfied if somebody thinks you're hateful, but you're in fact a loving person. You're not satisfied with that. Well, guess what? They're not satisfied until you are ruined in chaos. They're not satisfied with you begging for your life. They want you to curse your whole existence. See, they're different. They're born of a darkness you don't want any parts of. And again, in the Bible, it says light has no fellowship with darkness. And do you know why? It's impossible for that to ever happen. That's why you're repulsed by people that you just pass by them. You don't even know why. But some of you are repulsed. Something in them is opposite something in you. You're not in the darkness. You're not of the darkness. You're of Christ. And because you're of Christ, that day is not going to overtake you as a thief. Because a thief can only overtake those who are sleeping in their homes in the nighttime. You're going to be wide awake, not sleeping. You're children of the light, of righteousness, children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. And because of this, let's not get lazy in the world and do things of the world like everybody else is doing. But let us continue to search for Christ and be sincere, hopeful, full of good fruits, ready to do service for the sake of the gospel, not for our sakes, but for the sake of the gospel. Because those that sleep in the night, they're saturated with things of darkness. Saturated. They're full of things of darkness. They practice it every day you saw during the election. But let us, who are of the day, let us, who are of that great light, that rules the day, not the lesser light that rules the night, but the great light that rules the day. That's an example of our Father. Let us, who are children of the light, be aware and sincere, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. That breastplate of faith and love go together because the type of faith the Father has given us is not absent His love. It goes hand in hand with love. You can't separate the two. And for in helmet, the hope of salvation, which means the story of Christ is alive with us always. That's why we're watching. We're not watching to call out what everybody is doing wrong, but we're searching for Christ. We're ensuring that we finish the race according to the word of the Lord. We're correcting our lives, constantly purging and refining. And we do this because God has not put us on this earth to partake in the time of his wrath. But all this time we've been here, he made it so that we may obtain salvation. He called us, we didn't call him. We believe in him because God has put it in our hearts to believe in his son. We're obtaining salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, by his method who died for us. That whether we wake, whether we're fully redeemed, or some of us are young, or sleep in the world, they're sleeping in the darkness because they haven't woken up yet. Whether we be wake or sleep, we should live together with him. We'll eventually be redeemed. So comfort yourselves together. Lift up one another. That's why he said, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. We're not in darkness, that that day should overtake us as a thief. See, to those who are in darkness, who sleep in the world, when Jesus comes, that will be his wrath for them. That's why they shall hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. See, because when he comes, no one can utter a lying word before him. Truth will be known by all. And they're going to see it just like it is and say, Oh, fellas, we got to hide. We didn't messed up our whole lives and said, No, he didn't call us. Here it comes. The wrath is coming. We can't even escape. Rocks fall on us. Kill us. Do what you got to do. But hide us from Jesus who is surely coming. Hide us because we have messed up. That's what those who sleep in the world are going to do. Because Jesus will come at an unexpected time. A time they're not looking for him. The reason why he didn't come upon us in an unexpected time is because we're always looking for him. To watch means to look for Christ, to search him out, to follow him. And for those who follow Christ, how can he then come? How can he turn around when you're not aware? If you're following Christ and he turns around, you're going to stop. You've been seeing him all this time. He's not going to come upon you as a thief. But the world is not seeing him, nor are they concerned about him. So when he comes, he'll be, it'll be a great surprise for them. We're not appointed to his wrath. We're appointed to be saved by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 
5, 9. When they shall say peace and safety. Do you guys see that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3? Then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Do you know what that means? Because we're talking about those who sleep in the night. Worldly people who are not following Christ, but following pride, ego, practicing their own ways, killing everybody to further themselves. If they ever say peace and safety, that means they have accomplished their plans. Folks, are you hearing what I'm saying? Darkness, these people in the world who are not of the Lord will accomplish their plans. What is that called? A day is coming. See, when they say peace and safety, then they've accomplished something in the world of darkness that they have not accomplished yet. They have succeeded in unifying all darkness. Do you see that? That's a unification of all darkness. See, when darkness is unified on the face of the earth, that's when they'll say peace and safety. All throughout the Bible, all the kingdoms, that were in the earth were battling each other. They were never on one accord. God's children was often caught in the crossfire, but God God separated them. But they kept mingling back in with them. But they were always in a conflict. That goes on today. When darkness unifies, and they will unify, that's when they say peace and safety. And that's when sudden destruction will come upon them. That's when the wrath of the Lamb comes for those who dwell upon the earth. Now, not us. Because when he comes, the same moment he comes, it'll be wrath for them. It'll be our change. So he's coming as our Savior. At the same time, he'll be their destruction. Do you see that? He does not come as a destroyer for us. He comes as a destroyer for the ungodly. A lot of people get that confused too. They say, well, wait a minute, he's coming twice? Back again? No. It's describing all one event, but it's perceived differently based upon the choice you made.